Hello my dears, my name is Mariana and welcome to my channel. It's October now in New York City, which means that last week it was 80 degrees and this week it's 50, so you know, gotta love it. So today we're gonna talk about something that I am very passionate about and I realize I haven't yet talked about on this channel, so that's very exciting. Today we're gonna be talking about the heroine's journey. Now if you've stuck around here a little while, you definitely heard me talk about the hero's journey. I am absolutely obsessed with Joseph Campbell. I'm not ashamed to say it. He is uh, an idol, but I haven't really talked about the heroine's journey, which is a response to the hero's journey, kind of picking up the theme of the feminine hero and what her particular quest really is. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. So if you haven't yet read The Heroine's Journey, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is a fantastic read. It's written by a Jungian-oriented psychotherapist named Maureen Murdoch. So she actually got to meet with Joseph Campbell and asked him what he thought about the heroine, about the female-oriented mythology. And Joseph Campbell said something very classically male. <laughs> He said that women can't have their own mythologies because ultimately they're the goal of the quest itself. Yeah, and absolutely, that's, um, that's pretty awful. <laughs> but to be fair to Joe, what he really studied was the solar hero, the man questing after the great treasure or the reunion with the feminine. So often in those stories, the princess, the bride, the goddess was the goal, was the thing he was trying to get to. But of course, that doesn't mean that women don't get to have their own mythologies. And that is exactly what Maureen Murdoch talks about in this book. She really tries to figure out what is the heroine's journey? How does it differ from the hero's journey? And what do we need to learn about that today to really go on our own inner quests? And before we go any further, there's a very important announcement I have to make. On October 22nd, me and a brilliant Jungian mind, Alyssa Polizzi, are hosting a seminar called Waking the Heroine, a study of Marie Louise von Franz's The Feminine in Fairy Tales. Ta-da! It is going to be a deep dive into the archetypal significance of fairy tales through a Jungian and depth psychological lens. The arc of the heroine's journey in myths, particularly the myth of Vasilisa the Beautiful and Briar Rose. The archetypes of the feminine in fairy tales overall and in our own inner journeys, and a framework for interpreting myths and fairy tales through a psycho-spiritual perspective. This is an extremely rare event. A lot of people will give seminars and lectures on Jung, but almost nobody talks about the extraordinary work of Marie-Louise von Franz. So do yourself a favor, check it out. The link is in the description. It is really not one to miss. This has been a little dream of mine for a long time, and I am so excited and glad that Alyssa told me that she was just as interested in doing it as I was, and it is just so exciting that this has come together, so don't miss it. So now, if you've ever read The Hero's Journey or just casually looked it up online, you've seen that great circle and the sometimes 12, sometimes 17 stages of the journey. Though these are not all of them, usually they include the call to adventure, meeting the mentor, the crossing of the threshold, the belly of the whale, the approach of the inmost cave, the ordeal, the apotheosis, the magic flight, the resurrection, the seizing of the sword, and mastery over the two worlds. Sometimes these stages are called something slightly different or there are different variations of them, but that's the basic arc. Murdoch presents something slightly different. In Murdoch's heroine's journey, there's many things that overlap with Campbell's hero's journey. We also have the road of trials, the ultimate boon or reward, etc. But the main difference is that the key orientation in the heroine's journey is to reclamation with the feminine. The journey begins with a separation from the feminine, moving to identification with the masculine, road to trials, finding the boon of success, awakening to feelings of spiritual aridity, initiation and descent to the goddess, urgent yearning to reconnect with the feminine, healing the mother-daughter split, healing the wounded masculine, and the integration of the masculine and feminine. The goal of the journey ultimately is wholeness, where Campbell's hero would go off into the wild unknown to achieve some success, win some treasure, save some princess, 
heroine goes off into the unknown to discover all the missing pieces of herself. One of the ways that a lot of people like to break down these two different journeys is that the hero's journey is the extroverted journey, where the heroine's journey is the introverted one. And when we talk about extroversion and introversion, we're not only talking about whether you like to go to a party or not. I'm a very classic introvert and I'm great at a party unless it's filled with people I don't know, in which case I'm probably gonna hide in a corner all night long. Extroversion does not mean our sociability and introversion doesn't mean our shyness. It means our orientation to life. Extroverted people are generally oriented towards how they relate to the outer world, how they succeed, how they are appreciated, while introverted people are more oriented toward the inner world. What do they value? Who do they believe themselves to be? And while both of these journeys are very much about individuation and the act of becoming exactly who you are, they do take different approaches toward life. Now, you may be thinking the hero's journey is not necessarily oriented towards the masculine. It's not really about separation from the masculine or reclamation of the masculine. But the heroine's journey is really centered around the feminine. So what does that really mean? For the last 2,000 years, the archetypal feminine in our society has been almost entirely repressed. And if you want a little more info on what the hell I mean by that, go watch this video. It's worth it. But generally, our experience of the feminine has been through the lens of male perspective. So that's why in our stories, the woman is always the goal and not the hero. So when Murdoch gathered up all these stories centering the heroine, what she discovered is that so many of them are about that reconnection with what the feminine really is. What she discovered in so many of those stories is that the heroine at the center feels alienated from her own internal experience of the feminine principle. And so she goes through this entire journey to reconnect with it, to discover her own autonomy and particular power. So now all of this might be feeling a little abstract and academic, so let's bring it down to an example. Let's actually take the example of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. I hope you've seen it because I've seen it about 10,000 times. <laughs> My sister was very obsessed with that movie, very obsessed. So in the beginning, we find Dorothy Gale, just a normal kid, but she doesn't have a real mother or father there. Often in stories, the lack of a mother and father will represent that separation from those archetypal figures in our lives. But in particular, Dorothy is trying to get her Auntie M to listen to her, to accept her anger and her frustration and her confusion about how to navigate some pretty complex feelings she has about her neighbor. By the way, I played Dorothy in high school. Um, there's no other point to me saying that than just to fun little tidbit about me, I guess. <laughs> Auntie Anne dismisses these feelings, and after the tornado comes and Dorothy gets thrown into Oz, the whole rest of the journey seems to be about reconnecting to that sense of home and her acceptance there. The masculine figures of the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion are her companions as she moves through Oz. She goes on the road to trials, she has her successes and her failures. And as she's going through, she starts to feel a little hopeless. She starts to feel pretty scared. And then finally, she is captured by the Wicked Witch of the West. Here we have the initiation into the goddess. And yes, this might not seem like an initiation into the goddess, but it is. Because the Wicked Witch of the West, while not a goddess, but a witch, represents that goddess figure. She represents the dark feminine principle. And this is something that Dorothy was battling at the beginning of the story. She was having trouble with her neighbor and was seeking that comfort and acceptance of her feeling center from Auntie M. This is a common thread that we see in the heroine's journey. Marie-Louise von Franz, who is an absolutely brilliant Jungian analyst, wrote a lot about the feminine in fairy tales. Here it is. And one of the things that she brings up over and over again is that the heroine often has to deal with a mother complex. Now, what's a mother complex? Generally, a complex in depth psychology means a part of us that is broken off from the whole. It's usually wrapped around an archetypal center. In the case of a mother complex, it's wrapped around the archetype of the mother. In its most basic form, a mother complex develops when our own real mother does not live up to the archetypal mother. Maybe our mothers are cruel or neglectful. Maybe they are smothering. And as a collective, we all kind of have a mother complex because the great archetypal mother, the great goddess has been repressed. We see her as absent. And so women and all of us really have felt that alienation from that feminine because it's so missing in our society. 
And unlike so many other heroines, Dorothy has to confront that dark mother. While she's in the lair of the Wicked Witch, she yearns to connect with Auntie M and calls for her. There's this sort of magical glass orb and Auntie M actually appears in the orb and responds to Dorothy. So here's the symbol of the healing of that mother-daughter split. There's a deep reconnection through feeling. Of course, her companions come to rescue her, the witch is destroyed, and her companions, the masculine, is made whole. They are given a heart, a brain, and courage. But of course, these are the attributes that Dorothy herself has cultivated through her journey. The symbol of the brain represents her power of discernment. The heart represents her deep experience of feeling, and courage shows her own autonomy to live her life. With all of this now integrated, Dorothy is ready to return home. And one of the most beautiful symbols in this story are the ruby slippers, which show that Dorothy the whole time had that power and autonomy to go back home. Now, I want to return for a quick minute to von Franz's The Feminine and Fairy Tales. Both of them consider the psychology of the heroine's journey, but von Franz takes it a little bit deeper. One of the stories that Marie-Louise von Franz brings up is Briar Rose or Sleeping Beauty. And I think that this story is one of the most profound heroines journey for our modern day, for the collective. You might think there's not really much of a heroine in the story. She pricks her finger on a spindle and then goes to sleep forever. And you might also think, well, isn't it about the prince? Because he has to come and save her. And all of that's true, but it's really not about that. It's really about Briar Rose herself. As Von Franz points out, she is born after the king and queen have been desperate for a child for years, pointing to her status as the miracle child. This places the story firmly on her. It is about her and her own reawakening. She is cursed by the evil fairy, again representing that dark feminine. But the benevolent feminine saves her, and the last fairy says that she won't die when she pricks her finger on the spindle. Instead, she'll sleep for a hundred years. It's inevitable, Sleeping Beauty pricks her finger on the spindle and goes to sleep forever. After the curse is placed on Sleeping Beauty and she falls asleep, the entire castle, the whole world essentially falls asleep with her. Around the castle grows this wall of thorns, representing this emotional barrier to access the princess within. All of this is a pretty extraordinary metaphor for what we're going through right now, our collective heroine's journey. The archetype of the feminine has been put to sleep in us, and our quest is to go find it, to reawaken it. And that's our task as the heroine, is to find ourselves in the castle, to cut through the thorns and find out the true authentic experience of our own femininity, of our own autonomy and inner power. So anyway, if this is at all as interesting to you as it is to me, definitely go check out the Waking the Heroine seminar. Um, we are going to read through the book together. You don't have to read the book if you don't want to. Not everybody's a crazed reader like myself, I get it. But even if you don't read it, we're gonna move through it step by step, really looking at how to understand that archetypal potency of fairy tales. It's low cost, you get the replay if you can't make it live. It's really, it's really worth it. Okay, so that is my introduction to the heroine's journey. That was a bit crazy. I hope it made any sense at all. And if I didn't, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I tried. I'm a little bit dazed. The weather has made me a crazy sleepy person. Don't blame me. Make sure you follow me on Instagram. Make sure you subscribe. And I hope you have a beautiful, meaningful day, my friend. I got a new shirt and I think it's probably the dorkiest thing I've ever got and I'm absolutely obsessed with it. Yeah, it's an alchemical rose. If you recognize it as a Rosicrucian symbol, good for you. Mm -hmm.